Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I always thought Fred was tall until I saw him stand up next to Wesley. Then I realized Fred wasn't so tall after all. I was like, who is that Muslim over there? That's not a Muslim, that's Wesley. <laughs> You're not a Muslim, are you? Oh, he said no. He had a bow tie on, so it was for Jesus. Christ. There was a song written years ago, and when I begin to read the words, it's not one you would sing in church, I hope. But when you hear the words, you'll remember the song. And you might have danced to this song or did whatever you did to this song that you don't do anymore. It goes something like this. I'm not going to sing it, you know, because that wouldn't do it justice. It goes something sort of like this. You never close your eyes anymore when I kiss your lips. And there's no tenderness like before in your fingertips. You're trying hard not to show it. Baby, baby, I know it. And what's the next phrase? Nobody knows. You're just ashamed to say it in church, aren't you? That's right. You've lost that loving feeling. I know you know this song. Some of you are going over it in your head, aren't you? Who sang this song? Who remembers? The Righteous Brothers. I don't know if they're really righteous, but that's a righteous name to have, be called the Righteous Brothers. He said, now there's no welcome look in your eyes when I reach for you. And you're starting to criticize the little things that I do. You know, if you've ever been married, you know that happens, right? <laughs> Somebody happened this morning before they got to church. He says, it makes you just feel like crying because baby something's beautiful is dying. You know, when you hear these songs, you don't necessarily listen to the words all the time. But when you listen to these, I didn't know it said all this. I've sung, I've sung pieces of the song, but I didn't know. But I knew what he was talking about. He says, baby, I get down on my knees for you if you would only love me like you used to. I think you've lost that loving feeling. Well, hopefully now you know which direction I'm headed because my assignment today is to sort of encourage and challenge you all at the same time because it is a scary position when you read Revelation chapter 2 and you realize that you have lost that loving feeling towards God Almighty, the Savior of the world, and you don't even know it. Is that not crazy? Oftentimes, I get to, now that I don't pastor, I get to go to different churches, and I listen to pastors, and even before, if I came here, whatever pastor preached, I would go and take and look at it and read it myself and see what was going on. Like, last week, I was in a fairly large church, and I was listening to the pastor talk about the book of Ruth, and it got me back into the book of this of Ruth for about a week, and if you think Ruth is about some woman trying to find some man and the way to get it so she can have a good relationship, you are sadly mistaken. Ruth is all about the Savior of the world reaching into somebody's life and grabbing hold of their loneliness and their bitterness and their pain and their emptiness and bringing them out and being their redeemer. And God says that's what it's all about. That's what Ruth is about. It's not about women finding your Boaz. It's about the world finding a kinsman redeemer. And the church said amen to that. So a few months back, I was listening to some preacher, and he got on to Revelation chapter 2. And there was something that struck me when I got home and I read that, and it really bothered me. So I want to read Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 to you this morning, because it's a very familiar passage. But then again, I want to tell you the parts that really bothered me in this passage, and I had to go in and look for myself and find out exactly if I was this person. So Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, now let me stop and say this. God Almighty is, you know, speaking to these seven churches in the book of Revelation. 
And each church has a messenger or a pastor or a servant leader who's there taking care of the business. And God Almighty himself is looking down at the leader of each one of these churches. And he's telling them something about their church. Now, there's something you've got to understand because this is important. When the pastor or messenger or servant of God stands up, he's giving you direction, not from himself, from God Almighty. So when we read Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, it's not some pastor who has an idea of what his church is about. It's about God Almighty looking into this church and seeing what's wrong in this church. And if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. So when you read it, I want you to think about God. He's telling them this is what's right and this is what's wrong with this church. And we all read this before. So he said, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in the right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Verse 2, I know your deeds. Isn't that great? How great is that? God knows the good things you've done this week, and he knows the bad things you've done this week. He, he knows the righteous things you've done this week, and he knows the unrighteous things you've done this week. So he says, I know your deeds. He says, and here's what he says to the church. He says, man, he says, I know your hard work and your perseverance. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. This is no ordinary church. This is a great church. This is a magnificent church. These people are on top of it. They're getting the job done, folks. They are not growing weary of serving God Almighty. Well, that's pretty cool, though. Uh Uh-oh got to read verse 4. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Here's the first question I had when I read this. How can a church be so dynamic in doing God's business and looking at evil and recognizing the false teachers? Because if you look in the back of the book of Ephesians, Paul is warning the church at Ephesus that there are going to be false teachers that come and try to persuade you to live other than what I've told you. So this church is doing what God asked them to do. They're not growing weary. They're persevering, and they're enduring hardship. But God says there's something that you don't see that I see, and it's bothering me. He says you have forsaken your your first love. How does that happen? I ask myself, how does that happen? That, I, I just could not wrap my brain. How can you be in a servant mind, enduring, non-weary things of God, and you've lost your first love, and you don't know it? How does that happen? Well, then he says, he says, remember the height from which you have fallen and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, now that's a powerful word, and we're going to get to it in a minute, so if I have to repent, that means I've committed a, a sin. Well, that's crazy. How can I repent for something I don't know that I've done? But I've done it, obviously. And he says, it is so horrific, and it is so bad, and it is so against God that you don't even have, you don't have to just give a little extra in the plate. He says, you have to turn from that way. You have to repent. You have to turn around. You have to do it differently. So he's telling this great church that you have to repent. Then he says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. He says, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is, which is in the paradise of God. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for the awesomeness of your word. I pray that you challenge us, that we would accept that challenge by change in our lives if we fall into this category. And we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the beauties of this scripture is, God loved them so much that he didn't want them to stay in their condition that they were in. So he visited them to tell them 
that there was something wrong. See, God is a fair and a just God. He is always going to give you the opportunity to make change. Isn't that great? God always gives us the opportunity to make change. He is not going to say, oh, you were just going aimlessly in your life and you didn't make change. You say, well, pastor, I just, I don't know. I can't hear him. Well, there's a different problem there, but God is always talking to give you an opportunity to make change. That's because he loves you more than you love yourself. So let's talk about losing that loving feeling. The Christian life is about loving Christ. The Christian life is best defined as an ongoing relationship of love between the believer and Christ. It is not about God's love for us. It is always about our love for him because his love for us is fixed. It's unchangeable. But as you know from Revelation chapter 2, somehow, somewhere, our love for him changes. And one of the questions I had through this scripture is, why is it so important that I love God as much as he wants me to in Revelation chapter 2? What is the big deal? I know you don't talk to God that way, but I, I go, God, what is the big deal? Who cares if I love you that much? What's going to happen to me if I don't? What's the big problem? We're going to answer that in just a second. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 39, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Well, that's a clue. Because if I'm loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, he is always going to be my number one priority, bar none. He is always going to be my first option. He is always going to be my first choice. He is always going to be, like the guy said on the video, my world revolves around him always. Christian faith is about loving him singularly. It's about loving him obediently. It's about loving him totally. It's about loving him sacrificially. It's about loving him worshipfully. It's about loving him servantly. That's what it means to be a Christian. If you're here this morning and you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because you don't see the big deal about it, the big deal is, is that your sin won't get you into heaven. It is Jesus Christ who died for your sin that if you receive him today as your Lord and Savior and say, you know, I'm sorry for what I've done, that gets you to the step of being in heaven with him for eternity. And then your life revolves around him. When we got saved, it was all about our commitment to loving him. The real question to ask people when you talk about their spiritual growth, don't talk about whether they go to church, don't talk about if they sing on the worship team, don't talk if they're an usher, don't talk about how much they serve God, don't talk about how much they do for the kingdom. Here's what we should ask. Are you growing in your love for Christ? Do you love him more than you have in the past? Do you desire him more than you did in the past? And the right question to ask ourselves is, what is the state of my love for Christ? I'm not asking about your doctrinal beliefs. I'm not asking about your church customs. I'm not asking about your ministry of service. I'm not asking about your faithfulness and giving. I'm not asking about any of those things. I'm asking what is your condition of your love for Christ? Paul said, I do it because that I may know him, and the more that I know him, I love him. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up, we came to an Assembly of God church in 1977 in Rochester, New York. And uh, we used to sing the chorus, I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. 
isn't that what it's about? The more I know about him and how righteous and pure he is and how much he came into my life as a sinner and an unrighteous and impure person, that he met me at my very need and my hurt and my pain and my frustration. And yet he said, I will take you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The more I find about who he is and how he came to do that, the more I do that, the more I should be able to fall in love with him. Paul says, I'm driven to know more about him, to grasp every to grasp every reality concerning Christ, to understand every word he said, every deed he did, to understand the fullness of his purpose, his redemption, to know how he thought about everything. Paul was driven to serve, to exalt, to honor, to proclaim because he loved him. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 tells us, He who loves a father, he who loves his father or mother more than he is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. A couple of things I tell my children. One, I'm not going to jail for you. If you do something wrong, I'm calling the police. I'm turning you in. But dad, no but me. I like to eat what I want, where I want. I like to open my own bedroom door, get out, take my own shower. I don't want to have to get food out of a vending machine. I don't want to do any of that thing. So, son, particularly, you want to be stupid, you can bet your bottom dollar. I will call the police and tell them exactly where you're at. He said, you will turn you in. I will turn you in and out and upside down. I will have them come after you. He says, but you love me. Yes, I do. And I love me too. My daughter says, Dad, you turn me in? Yeah. I love you, but I'll turn you in. My wife, anybody, I'm not going to jail. (laughs) Officer, there they are. When we're willing to lose our life for him, when we're willing to hate yourself and all your dreams and ambitions, hopes, desires, it's about loving Christ singularly. Second Corinthians chapter 5, he says to love Christ constrains us, Paul says. It controls us. It drives us. It motivates us. So let me ask you this. If you're falling out of love with God, something else is driving you, something else is constraining you, and something else is motivating you. Because when I love the Lord the God, my God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, that motivates me. That constrains me. That directs me. If I don't, something else begins to move in that is not God. And it begins to take my actions and my thoughts and my theology and all of my stuff and leads me to a place I shouldn't go. Because what God was concerned about in the church of, of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 is that when you fall out of lo- love with God, you have the potential of going down a road of spiritual corruption is a lot greater than those who are in love with God. So when I was reading Revelation chapter 2, it hit me. God wants us to maintain that loving relationship with him first because it's good for you to know that God is almighty and that you should be in love with him. But secondly, it keeps me on the path that I should go in. And if I'm not loving him, I have the chance of wandering where I shouldn't wander. See, service doesn't do that. Tithing doesn't do that. Worship doesn't do that. Do you understand? All of these things are based on our commitment and our love to God. And the more I love him, the more I'm apt to do what he tells me to do. We were singing that song, he is perfect in all of his ways. What does that mean? Even if you disagree with the way God is handling your business, he is perfect in that. That's where we get tripped up, isn't it? How do we define a Christian? By their love for God, by their love for the Lord, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 looks at it from a negative side. If any man not love the Lord, let him be accursed. Uh Uh-oh, we've got a problem. The question is a hard question. Do you love the Lord Jesus with all your heart? Is he, it was he who said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. You, You ever see somebody 
who is not walking with the Lord and they tell you something like this, oh, I love God. You know, they're, they're not bearing fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, all of that thing. They're not doing any of those things. But they tell you, oh, people who have never been to church, there are some in here, you've never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, yet you tell people, I love God. And the Bible clearly says that if you loved God, you would. Not maybe, perhaps, on occasion. It says that you would absolutely, unequivocally, 100% follow the commands of God if you loved him. How about this? How about, how many of you are married? Let me see your hands and don't be ashamed to say it. Okay. Let's say your husband comes home. Pastor Jimmy was late on that. He forgot he was married. We're here to help you, brother. There's your wife right next to you. How about if your wife comes home one day and goes, honey, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to clean. I'm going to do all of those things. But you know what? I don't think I love you anymore. And you say to her, well, that's okay. Your husband comes home, you know, I'm going to pay all the bills and I'm going to make sure the cars are fixed and I'm going to cut the grass and make sure the house is in order and we'll go out to dinner every now and again. But guess what? I don't think I like you that much. Teenagers are not exempt for this anyway. The girl that you thought was of your dreams or the guy that you thought was in your dreams and he was hot even though he had a tooth missing and somehow whatever's going on. And you decided he's, that's what my son is right now. He thinks his girlfriend's a cat's meow. And she might be meow, but I don't know what she is. But anyway... You have to turn, take that out of the television because he might watch it. <laughs> Parents are that way sometimes, aren't we? We know who's right for our children. I don't care what you say, we know. Isn't that right? Anyway, you know, you love the guy and you see he's a cat's meow and you love the girl and then they come, you know what, I'm going to, you know, eat dinner with you or eat at the lunch table with you and all that, but I don't really like you that much. Oh, sure, sit down, have a seat. That's not the way it works. God, you know what? I ain't going to go to church even when I don't feel like it. And I'm going to do all these things for you. And I'm going to serve you. And you know what? I'm going to put my 10% in the offering. I'm going to give a little extra. We're going to help with missions. And we're going to go and we're going to do some Saturday stuff. And we're going to do all this stuff. And I'm going to be on a worship team. And I'm going to help. I'm going to usher in the church. And I'm going to do all the ministry of the church. But you know what, God? I just want you to know up front, I'm going to do all these things for you. But I really don't care for you all that much. I really don't love you as much as I used to, but I'm going to do all those things for you. God's not saying, oh, you're hurting my feelings. God's saying, you know, you're in a potential danger zone because you're going to wander up the path of spiritual trueness that comes to honoring him with your life, and that's a danger zone. See, I heard the, the one phrase I did like in the service I was in last week. I don't know where the pastor got it from. But he says, you need closeness in order to make an impact. He said, you can impress from a distance, but impact comes with closeness. You can impress us from a distance without a good relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but you can't make an impact without being close to him or being in love with him. Does that make sense? Made a world of sense to me. So he says, you know what? You've been faithful. You've done all of these things, and there's something wrong he said, there's something that you have to take care of. And he says these three things. He said, you've got to fix this. It's not just for the good of the entire church at, the Ephes at Ephesus. It's good for the individual. So God Almighty himself speaks to the servant of the church of Ephesus, and he says, tell them they have to remember. Verse 5, they have to remember where they used to be. Remember when you first got saved and how you just, your Bible was, it was just insatiable. You were reading it and you couldn't get enough and worship was true to you because you were dancing and shouting because you, you actually got saved. You realized that God was it for you. Do you remember how you were willing to sign up and do everything because your love for God was great because you knew him and all that he was and it was fresh and it was one. You knew all of those things. Do you remember how lost you were? Do you remember how desperate and destitute you were? Do you remember how off the beaten path of spiritual rightness you were? 
you remember the immorality that you were involved in and God set you free? Do you remember the pain of coming to a broken family and God stepped in? Do you remember those things? Do you remember what happened when the power of the word of God first exploded inside of you? You knew it was the right thing. Do you remember the joy, the exhilaration, the satisfaction, and the overwhelming peace that came in your first encounter? Now, I'm a realist in the sense that I'm not sure you can get that first meeting impact like you had before. But you can get that passion for the love of God back. See, because do you know that people can sense when visitors come and sit next to you, they can sense if you really want to be here or not. My daughter comes home, she goes, my boss says people can sense when you and your coworkers are having a tiff. She goes, I don't think so because we're just as cheery and bubbly. No, they get a sense of it. So he says, remember, there is a spiritual defection that can come from forgetting. The Bible constantly calls us to remember all the feasts and festivals throughout the Old Testament that were designed to teach Israel to remember. Do you know when you take communion, it's just not about a little juice and a little cracker. This is about remembering how much God did for you. It's about remembering the love that he had, that he sent his only begotten son, and his son died on the cross, and his blood was shed, and his body was broken. It's remembering that you had a way out provided for God. When you take communion, it's remembering what God has done for you as an individual. Peter says, I write these things in remembrance. Go back and remember what you felt. Go back and remember how you were overwhelmed with joy. You couldn't get enough of Bible teaching. Remember when you came to church on Sunday and Wednesday because you just needed the word of God? You couldn't get enough time alone with the Lord. Your, your schedule was hectic, but you still found time to honor him or to get to know him or to see what he was saying to you. Remember when you couldn't talk about Jesus to people around you enough? Remember when you just couldn't get enough of him? We look at our lives and we ask, is there anything you love more than Christ this morning? That's only something you can decide. See, if I love him, my actions will show how much I love him because I obey his commands. Is there anything we want more than Christ this morning? Is there anything that you want to serve or anyone that you want to serve more than Christ this morning? Anyone you might want to honor more than Christ this morning? Anyone you want to proclaim more than Christ this morning? If so, you have left, forsaken, turned away from, neglected your first love. Then secondly, he doesn't just tell us to remember. He says, you know, you've fallen. And now you have to repent. Lord Jesus, forgive me for whatever I've done to fall out of love with you. So God, I repent and I return away from that and I want to get back into knowing you as much as I did when it first happened. That's something between you and I. Sometimes as a pastor, you get so busy prep preparing. I remember when I used to have to prepare for Sunday night and Sunday morning and Wednesday night, and they're all different series or different subjects, and you had to prepare. And sometimes I had to be careful because I thought my preparation was my passion, and it really wasn't. Preparation is necessary. But Jesus still should be my passion because I was doing all of those things thinking, well, I'm learning about the word of God and that should be good enough. I'm doing all of this stuff and that should be good enough. But there was no individual intensity time that I had with him because I thought maybe preparing was enough. The reason we have to re repent is because we've replaced God with something or someone else. That's why he says you have fallen. 
Now, only you can decide whether you've fallen or not. It's not my job to decide each one in this room has fallen. It's my job to encourage you that if you have, God's grace picks you back up again. Did you understand what I just said? God's grace picks you back up again. His grace is amazing, not because it's part of his personality. It's amazing because he steps into your life when you don't deserve it. He steps into your life when you deserve to waddle in your own and our own stupidity and sin and frustration. But God is willing to step in. That's why it's so amazing. It's amazing to us. Confess the sin of losing your first love or leaving your first love. Confess the sin of your coldness or my coldness. Confess the sin of sort of a routine approach to worship and everyone else in your Christian life. Confess the sin of serving the Lord without exuberance and joy. Confess the sin of only doing your duty. Confess the sin of doing what you do. You do because you think somebody else wants to see it and therefore you think you ought to do well. He said, there's a time for this church to repent. And then thirdly, he said, you just got to redo. You got to redo this thing. James chapter 4, verse 8 says, if you draw close to God, what's he going to do, church? He said, he will draw close to you. It's a promise. If you're willing to put in the effort to draw close to him, he, the worker of the universe, is not that busy that he won't draw close to you. Do the deed you did at first. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16, I think it's 24, talks about how much they loved God at first. You know, Paul spent, Acts chapter 19 tells us he spent three years haggling over the things of God with the church at Ephesus. He really was in there struggling to get them to a place where they were in love with God. And then God himself says, you know what, you need to redo this thing. You need to go back. When you were swept up in prayer and Bible study and fellowship and witnessing and worship, it was also exhilarating for people were transformed. Remember how good it is. He said, redo those things. If you've fallen, repent. Because it's sin not to love him with all your heart, soul, and mind. He said, ask for forgiveness. Redo it. Now, I know there's some in this place with a group this size that my goal is for the spirit of grace to prick your heart this morning and see if you have to redo. To see if you have to go back and fall in love with him over and over again. Because you know, when I fall out of love with God, as the righteous brother says, you criticize the little things. You criticize the little things when you step into the church. Every little thing. You know, Pastor Jimmy, when I walked into this morning, he started to whine. They gave me a bottle of Dasani water. He says, they give you Dasani water. All I get is this Sam's brand or whatever it is. There's a man who's fallen out of love with God. You see how that works? So what I do to sort of bring him back, I go, Jimmy, go over and get pastor's water and drink it. So Jimmy goes, okay. He takes the name off and look, he's drinking it. You see how that is? When you fall out of love with God, you just got to be careful what water you serve in church. But that's the way it is. Now, there are some of you who have been powerful servants of God, but when you come into the church, you find every little thing wrong. That's a guarantee. Sometimes I think you're falling out of love with God. You know, when I go to churches and listen, I try not to be critical. I just go in and try to enjoy the worship and enjoy the preaching and I like to see what they're doing and what they're trying to accomplish. And sometimes I, my knuckles are turning white because I'm holding my Bible. And I'm like, I can't believe you just said that in public to all these people. Do you find yourself critical of the things of God? It might be time to redo. 
But my prayer for you this morning is, you know what? Ask God. Because what he said he'll do next, he says, if you're not remembering, you're not repenting, and you're not redoing, he says, you will be removed. I don't think he's talking about eternal damnation. But he says, your impact is not going to be what it should be. You know, people talk about destiny. You know what your destiny is? Everybody in this room has the very same destiny. And that destiny is to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind and understand. That is your destiny. So he says, if you don't do that, he says, I'm going to remove you. He says, I'm going to have to do away with it. I'm going to have to get you out of the way. I don't think we want God removing us this morning. Johnny Erickson Tata, you know, the one who dove off of a bridge and there was more land than water and he broke her spine and she never walked again. Now she paints with her feet and her mouth and you've seen her. She says this, if you desire life deep and if you desire life rich, and if you desire life meaningful, now you got to remember, this is a woman who's been in a, che- a, uh, a wheelchair for as long as I can remember. She says, if you desire a life that is deep, rich, and meaningful, then it is simply loving God. One of the professors at Southeastern always said, that profundity rides on the wings of simplicity. So here's the simple. If you want a rich, deep, obedient life, it's all about loving God. So I ask you this morning, because I had to ask myself this question, and I'm done. I had 10 people tell me, if you go too long, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. So I was fearful when I stepped up here today. So all of you folks, I'm done, but I'm not done. Because I want to give you a chance to repent. I don't know if you will. This is not about anybody else in the room. You know, like I tell my kids, I'm not going to jail for you. I'm not going to hell for anybody in this room. Y'all can have it. It's all yours. But I want you to be challenged this morning and encouraged. Because, you know, to love the Lord your God and see it affects those around you. Because he said the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God and what? Love your neighbor as yourself. So if you're not loving the Lord your God as deep as you should, then you're affecting your neighbor wrongfully. may not be a lot. It might be just a little. So I want to ask you this morning, if you ask yourself those questions, if that's you, I want you to stand. And we're just going to pray for you. It's that simple. It's not that difficult. I'm standing. I'll be the first one to stand. We don't need music to get you going. You know who you are. I don't need your eyes closed. If you feel like, you know what, I think I need to redo, then I just want to pray for you this morning. If not, Call Pastor Jimmy up with his water and we're going to leave. See, I think it's that fair. I think it's that simple, church. You don't need to be coerced to do what is right. Anybody? Well, at least you'll think about it. Yes, thank you. Let's see, see how great that is. God is so pleased this morning. He is so pleased. And I want you to know that I am pleased because of your strength of faith this morning. It's not an easy task, but I just want to pray for you. You don't have to move. You don't have to get up, but I want to pray for you. If you want to, you're more than welcome to come. If, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you came to this church this morning, and you're, you're like, I don't know if I want to commit my life to him, you're more than welcome to come. Because my thing is, when you're ready, you'll be ready. I hope you're ready today. But if you're not ready, don't come up here and perform a song and a dance for us because it's not going to do you any good when you leave the church. You understand what I'm saying? 
If you're ready, come on up. If you're not ready, then hopefully Jesus doesn't come while you're making up your mind because if you do, then it's too late. And I don't say that to scare you. I'm just saying at some point I pray that you get ready before Jesus Christ comes. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Lord, I thank you for the folks that stood in faith and said, you know what? There might be an issue here. But there is no issue greater than God's grace this morning. And Lord, I just pray that as they repent to you, that God, you would begin to fill them. It's just like Naomi in the book of Ruth. She once thought she was empty, but God, you came alongside and filled her up. God, I pray that you would strengthen them, that you would give them the passion that they had before by them putting into practice those things that they did before that they remember all that you've done for them and how much they loved you at first, God, and to return to that first love that they have forsaken and neglected. And Lord, we repent as a group this morning to say, forgive us for falling. Forgive us of our sin, of walking away from you, walking away from that first love, not the actions, but that first love, and that's the important things. Lord, we just repent to you. Would you just, those of you that stood up here, would you just lift your hands, and we'll just give you a few seconds to, to just repent before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin, because that's what you call it, because if I have to repent, it's sin. And you just spend a little, just a few seconds doing that this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's great courage for these folks today. And there's greater grace for them this morning. Father, let this be a lifestyle change for them. Lord Jesus, let them get close to you to be impactful, God. As you promised that you will draw close to them when they draw close to you. Lord, I ask that you just reach down from heaven and just... Wrap your arms around them and tell them, job well done this morning.